This episode of the Missions Podcast is sponsored by Radius International. Radius International is a nine-month training program that immerses students in missions and prepares them for culture and language acquisition, evangelism, and church planting among unreached language groups. Their gap year program is available for 18 through 25 year olds seeking to participate in the Great Commission with an impact on unreached people groups. Gap year interns focus on three things, learning, serving, and growing. They serve in different aspects of the Radius training program and learn through times in class and one-on-one time with staff mentors. And they have opportunities to grow in their walk with the Lord. For more information, go to radiusinternational.org. And while you're there, Thank them for sponsoring the Missions Podcast. And welcome to the Missions Podcast, the show that explores your hard questions on missions, theology, and practice to help goers think and thinkers go. I'm Alex Kochman, Director of Communications and Media with ABWE, here again for the second week in a row, flying solo without the beloved co-host Scott Dunford pastor of Redeemer Church in Fremont, California. Guys, he's fine. He's fine. He's just on vacation. And I know you're thinking, well, he was on vacation last week. Well, we may or may not record these in real time, but I'll leave that for you to decide whether you're a first time listener or a returning listener. Thanks for being with us. And if you believe in the show before you lo- go, remember to subscribe and share and give it a positive rating. That'll help get the content in front of other people who can be blessed by it. But today we have an important topic before us, the mission of the church. Does the church have one mission or does it have two missions? And here to help us answer that question is Justin Schell. He is the U.S. director of the Union School of Theology, and he's also the co-author of a new book with Glenn Scrivener, who's, who we've had on the show before as well. Justin, I asked a big question, and we're actually going to answer that a little bit later. First, I'd like you to share just who you are, what's the book, Come and See, A Theology of Mission and, and, a, and a History of Mission as well, Come and See, the book with Glenn, and what are you doing for Union? Tell us a little bit about Justin. Yeah, thanks, Alex, for having me on, and um, I'm calling in from Tulsa, Oklahoma. So, um, husband to Megan of 20 years, uh, dad to Henry and Evie. And we thought we would be in the Muslim world our whole lives. We were in North Africa and the plan was bury us in the Sahara Mm -hmm. until some family health needs meant that we didn't get to choose where we lived. And so trusting God's sovereignty, we moved back to the States. And so I'm in in Tulsa now. And uh, yeah, you mentioned that I'm the U.S. Director for Union. Uh, Union's a ministry based out of the U.K. led by a guy named Michael Reeves probably most well known for his book, Delighting in the Trinity. But uh, the union has a school of theology uh, as well as uh, a publishing arm, as well as a a research arm and even a mission arm where we're helping fund church plants and revitalizations the best we can. So that's a little bit about union. That's that's where I am in the world. And uh, union publishing uh, has put out this book with uh, myself and Glenn Scrivener called Come and title See. title I totally butchered in the introduction. Come and see. Yes. Come and see. What? I can't remember what you said now. I, I butchered the subtitle. So it's okay. a it's a history and a theology of mission. So that dovetails to our first question. Why do we need a bother, another book, brother, on a on a history <laughs> and a theology of mission? As important yeah. as that is. Absolutely. That's a good question. Uh, you know, we we wanted... I would say two things to happen with this. First, we wanted to write a very accessible history and theology of mission. Most books who are trying to introduce people to a history and theology of mission are targeted at maybe Bible college, maybe seminary. And I think this could perhaps be used in a freshman mission course, but it's really targeted to people who They've, they've read nothing. They've researched nothing about missions. They are in the local church or maybe they're part of a campus ministry. And it's uh, me and a handful of people in a small group. And we're trying to understand God's heart for the world, mm-hmm. trying to understand a little bit about what the Bible says about that and uh, how the church is engaged historically. So I, I think that's probably the first difference. Second, we we really wanted to hammer that mission has the flow out of who God is. 
And so uh, instead of just starting with the lostness of man, instead of maybe just starting with, you know, where in the world the gospels are not yet, and we get there, and that's important, we want to start with who God is and uh, allow that to really shape the theology, the, the way we look at Scripture and, and God's mission in Scripture, and then certainly the way we engage in the mission. Well, I love that vision to put the proverbial cookies on the bottom shelf. I had a lady at our church a couple of years ago say to me something in passing, something like, ah, oh, missions. Yeah, I've, I've always wanted to look into that. <laughs> Mm. I always wanted to know yes. more about that. And it's easy for us to assume people have an understanding of missions from scripture, but you look at the studies, more than half of people yeah. in our churches don't even know what the Great Commission is. And so speaking yeah. of that, what with with the students that you've maybe seen and worked with, whether it's on the U.S. side or even some of your coworkers in the U.K., what's the current temperature of a knowledge of missions. Is it that dire that no one's heard of the great commission and that's why we need that book? Is there some interest there? We just need to blow those flames, fan those flames a little bit, blow those sparks and embers until they ignite. Well, what does that look like to you? What's the current read that you have? Yeah, that's a good question. And and I'm going to have to try to answer, I guess, anecdotally from what the conversations I'm having, what I am seeing. Of course, you could look at a partnership between Alpha and Barna that saw that uh, wasn't it like half of all millennials who believe uh, millennial evangelicals apparently who believe that it's it's a bad thing for you to share your faith in hopes mm. that someone would be converted and so if, if those are the the with evangelicals the, like that who needs unbelievers <laughs> absolutely yeah. not only is it something where Christians aren't sure if they can share their faith or should share their faith. But those that maybe do think, yeah, sharing our, my faith is good. But mission, if, if, if there's just one verse at the end of Matthew about mission, well, there's more, more verses in the Bible about guys with long hair and, and skin disease. So mm. it can't be that important. So there's still a lack of education, a lack of general, just basic mission knowledge. And uh, so I actually hope more of these books will be written um, because only a handful of people are going to find mine, but hopefully they'll find someone else's. Well, hopefully it'll be a bigger handful after uh, this show. That's right. Amen. And, yeah, and appreciate the work that you're doing. Lord willing, indeed. Well, the title is interesting, Come and See. And we've talked recently on this show about what both Testaments, especially even the Old Testament, has to say okay. about missions uh, one of the tropes that you'll hear in the missions world is that, well, there's a shift from Old Testament to new from this come and see paradigm, meaning come and see mm -hmm. what God is doing through Israel. And only in the New Testament is there a sort of a go and tell mandate. Now, that can be mm -hmm. an oversimplification. Maybe it's helpful. Do you address any of that in the book? How do you unpack the title of the book? Is that a helpful distinction at all? Or has it always been a mix of both, in your opinion? Yeah, that's that's a good question. the The title has nothing to do with that particular um, <laughs> dichotomy. All good. Between Moving along now. <laughs> and stitch, you go. You know the 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 pull versus the push of mission. Sure. So actually, what we're trying to say is, until we come and see God and understand who He is and delight in Him, then even if we do go and tell. We're going to do that poorly. We're going to be like the Pharisees who travel halfway around the world to make converts who mm. are twice the sons of hell as they are. Um, and so that verse hits different every time. Yeah. Yeah. The come and see is think John one, Andrew encounters Jesus and he encounters him and, and we, we don't get any details, but he has such an encounter that the first thing he does is he goes to tell Peter hey, you've got to come see this guy. Or, or similarly, a little bit later with the story with Nathaniel and Philip, you spend a little time with Jesus and the first thing you really want to do is go get your best friend and say, we found the Messiah mm. or the woman at the well. Come and see the man that, that, that's told me everything I've, I've ever done. And so that's the come and see. Come and look at the theology. Look at what God has done in history. Be amazed at who he is. And the hope is actually that we would eventually have a follow-up volume called Go and Tell, 
where it's not a theology and history of mission. Okay. It is a the church on mission. So mm. more of that that going side. I can take so a stab. So I wasn't at out of the, left uh, field completely. No. Okay. <laughs> no. I'm happy to talk about Old Testament versus New Testament mission, but that's not where the where the title comes from. Well, happy to hear that there's more on the way. One of the important things that you discuss in the book is the history of mission, not just the theology or the biblical theology of it, the history of it, especially over the last 500 years coming out of the Reformation. And you hint at some of the ways that the Reformation might have laid the groundwork for modern missions. Now, you could look skeptically at the Reformers and say, well, they weren't really talking and thinking about writing, uh, uh, about reaching the, the unreached, as we would call it today. They weren't doing that so much, were they? And so what was the legacy of the Reformation with regard to missions? And why does it matter? I think it matters because it's just bad history to say that they didn't care about mission <laughs> to begin with. It they is, weren't just uh, the frozen uh, chosen? No, no, they weren't just in an ivory tower uh, trying to figure out how they can make Geneva just, just a little bit more Christian. Whether it's in courses like the Perspectives class or, or other kind of books introducing the history of mission, often that's the accusation. These guys were just nitpicking on theology. If they really were, you know, committed, they would they would have been sending fleets out of missionaries to the unreached. And and I think some of the things we have to keep in mind is is first to assume that they needed to be sending places other than Europe assumes that the church in Europe had the gospel, was filled with believers and was was reached, if we want to use our our current language. And so, you know, you might say there's churches all over medieval Europe. Why would you spend so much time, Martin Luther, John Calvin, et cetera, reaching, trying to, trying to reach Europe? Well, because they didn't know the gospel. And so they were busy about getting the gospel to the people, not just around them, but, but certainly the people around them with the gospel. I think the other thing to remember is when you think of the headquarters of the Reformation, uh, these were almost completely landlocked, say Germany and, and then Switzerland, definitely surrounded by people who wanted to kill them. <laughs> and so, hey, hey, we'd love to send more people all over the world, maybe, but we are, uh, we're in a, a literal battle as Catholic forces are surrounding us. So I think the the accusation there it's just unhelpful. Right. And then in the chapter, we do try to talk about both the sending of, say, the church in Geneva and, and the thousands of church planters and the, the thousands of churches being planted coming out of that, that one movement there. Mm. But I, I do think the other thing to, to remember is a lot of the, the groundwork for the modern mission movement was laid, as, as you've mentioned, in the Reformation, whether it's the, the use of the printing press. Uh, and the translation of the Bible into vernacular and um, the priesthood of, of all believers yep. giving the gospel back to men and women to be able to, to share it with their neighbors and, and eventually with, who knows, maybe even people around the world. Mm. So a lot of things that, that now comprise basic Christian practice in mission really, really traces back to the Reformation. And you certainly don't get any kind of a modern missionary movement without a recovery of the gospel and a recovery of a doctrine of personal uh, conversion, salvation, justification by faith. Those sorts of things produce that attitude like you're discussing from John 1. Hey, I've got to tell someone about this. Right. And we see that bloom a little bit later in history, maybe not the 16th century, more into the 17th century and even 18th. But when it comes to fruition, that's how we get the modern missionary movement for sure. And so some important groundwork that you both lay there in the book. You did make a throwaway comment earlier, though, and I want to explore it for just a a moment. Obviously, we don't want to be ivory tower intellectuals just committed to continuing to upbuild our own communities. But there is something to be said for there's some community building and some Christian culture making that has to be done before missions is even sustainable. Uh, certainly historically, the, the reformers had to figure that out. They had to f- have a foundation to build on in order to send out. That, that assumes that you've got 
kind of a mothership, kind of a hub going before you're ready to send, before you even know who you're sending or what the goal is. What are they even trying to produce in other places across the world? And I think for us today, too, there's certainly a lot of disinterest in missions in, in Christian circles. There's also a lot of evangelical circles where it's easy to love some nameless faceless person or an orphan a half a world away and to signal our virtue about missions without actually being about the work of mission here at home, which includes bringing all of our lives, all of our churches, our families, our educational systems, even local governments, all these sorts of things through the gospel under the feet of Jesus. And as we spread the the influence of the gospel, then that does leak out to the nations. And so, yes, go and tell, but also come and see what God is doing through our churches here. And from there, yeah. we go out to to spread the gospel. Yeah, I, that's right. I, the statement um, about ivory towers, I think we've got to remember these guys were, they weren't in an ivory tower, just kind right. of uh, clicking along, uh, shuffling their pages. Uh, they were preaching, uh, whether it's Calvin or, or Luther or you pick anyone, they were, they were preaching how many times a week. They were trying to organize churches. They were trying to fund church plants. They were they were receiving refugees from other parts of Europe, helping them both settle and be equipped to go back and, and actually take the gospel back to those places. And so I, I'd say first that, that none of them were doing whatever you might imagine happens in an ivory tower as brilliant as they were, right? But you're right. I think um, you're talking about how, how many years would it take, maybe how many generations would it take for a church to, that's been in, the, in, in gospel darkness to figure out, well, what's mm. it look like for this beautiful gospel truth that we've rediscovered to create a community? What's it look like? How do we organize around this? Mm. What does how do we flesh out and work out and tease out the, the consequences of, of this beautiful theology into our lives? So I, I think that's, that's a good point and, and very fair to, to say it just, it takes time. And we certainly, uh, just like I mentioned, the Pharisees going out with a, with a false gospel, we, we don't want to send out those who are simply going to plant unhealthy churches and right. who are going to proclaim a half gospel or a, which is no gospel at all. Uh, so absolutely. We don't want to be hasty in the laying on of hands, uh, as you know, Paul like, says in first Timothy, uh, chapter five, yeah. but also just to use a, a little bit of an analogy here too. The last conversation that we had was about movements. It was about the fact that we should be planting churches with the DNA of reproduction. There's truth in that as well, but with any living organism, it doesn't reproduce right away. It never reproduces when it's born. It has to develop before it's capable of reproduction. And I think so often in missional circles, we talk about, well, you know, you'll strengthen your church by multiplying it by, and by, by, by chopping it up sort of like an amoeba and never letting it right. grow past a certain size. And maybe that's mm-hmm. true, but I've also been a part of some churches that were not quite fully matured yet in order to be able to reproduce. And so it's important for us to build cultures in our churches that embody the gospel before we're ready to send. Right. And then let's send when we're ready. And so, yes, let's come and see what the Lord is doing in our churches and then let's go out to the nations and tell what he's up to. But let's talk about the obligations of the church. We set this conversation up with that big question, what is the mission of the church? You write about that a little bit, but you actually write about two particular tasks. So talk to us about proclamation of the word. Is that the ministry of the church? Is that the calling, the mission of the church? Is there more to it than just that? Yeah, that's a good question. I do think the most helpful part of the book when we're talking about what is the mission of the church and how do, for instance, good deeds play a role in that. It, I think the most helpful part is when we talk about revelation, we are called as the church to witness to what God has done in Christ. And um, certainly our, our good deeds can play a role in witnessing, but they, they're a bit like, as we say, general revelation where Yes, you can look at creation and see that there is a divine, powerful creator there if you're not suppressing the truth, but that's not going to save you. You you can't reason from general revelation to to the gospel, to who God is. And that's a lot like our good works in mission. 
they can show a little something about who God is or about what righteousness looks like. There can be a, a witnessing effect to our service and our love and our compassion. But the church, we're concerned with, with a mission. We, are, we, we have a mission to, of proclamation. We have a mission where a special revelation is what we're communicating. And that's, that's the primary witness. That's the witness that's going to save man. That's, that's the witness that's going to sweep men and women up into relationship with the triune God. And so I don't know if, um, it, it, did I answer the question there? Uh, of course we, I, yeah, we have an obligation. Of, of course we have an obligation to proclaim the gospel. And that's a big piece of the church's mission. So then with that in mind, thinking about where you sort of work in the book, especially in some of the later chapters, what about you, mercy? What about acts of mercy? Where does that fall into our understanding of mission? Is that a part of mission? Is that a different obligation? There's conversations in the missions world about prioritism. Do do we put evangelism first and everything necessarily takes some kind of a backseat or holism? Uh, Is evangelism simply uh, loving one's neighbor? Uh, Kind of John Stott's view where he started to develop through the conversations with Billy Graham going back into the day. Is, is that the model that we're looking at? Because I think for those in your audience who are new to the idea of mission, that could mean really anything. It could mean, right. well, I'm called to be an evangelist. It could mean digging wells in Africa. Give us some right. connecting dots to understand proclamation as the mission of the church and mercy as a part of that mission too. How would you define that? Yeah, so I would say that the proclamation piece is the the special revelation. It is whether you want to use the language of priority or central, um, it is the capital T, the mission of the church, is a witnessing primarily with words. This is, um, so you can talk with Glenn and see if he might uh, phrase it a little bit differently too. But so this is Justin. And this, is, uh, this is my attempt to answer this question as clearly as I can from my point of view. And so then what role does mercy play? Again, I think it has a witnessing effect. It can bridge to the gospel. It can help point or prepare the way for the gospel, but it doesn't explain the gospel. It doesn't proclaim the gospel. And so we've, we've heard people say the World Bank will help, help with, uh, say, um, economic relief in parts of the world. And, and so the church doesn't have to do that alone. Or uh, maybe UNICEF will help with community development, (laughs) even the NFL is all about, um, you know, inner inner city youth. Mm. Yeah. Let's outsource all of our duties. Yeah. But it's only the church that has this particular mission of making disciples of all nations, Mm. of proclaiming Christ, of preaching Christ. The NFL, NFL can engage in all sorts of good works without any fear that they're advancing the kingdom of God without any fear that they are helping complete the Great Commission. Uh, so I, w- I would say, on the one hand, mercy, justice, those are activities that can help point to the ultimate mission, help be a, have a witnessing effect. But then I would, I would also say, just like our salvation, isn't, um, it's not just a legal thing, that's a, that's a basis but we are, according to Galatians 4, we are redeemed for adoption in order to have family. So we are, the, that legal piece underlies the relational aspect. We're being brought into the son's own relationship with the father. Mm-hmm. And similarly, our mission, we, we don't, because that's our salvation, right? We are being united with an overflowing kind, gracious, merciful Father, we, as Christians, we're going to do that. We should do that. We should care about the the poor, the widow, the orphan. It should be a part of our mission because it's because we're Christians and we're the ones on the mission. Yeah. We are saved to do something. Amen. Yeah. Someone might say, well, that's just discipleship. That's not mission. Or that's Christian ethics, not Christian mission. We all talk about this 
a little bit differently. But I would, I would say we've got to keep the word, keep the gospel centered to our mission, keep that bringing men and women into relationship with, with the triune God. That's central. And we, yeah, of course, we love, we care. I don't know any missionary anywhere in the world who's, even if they would define themselves as prioritists, who's not doing amazing work, loving their neighbors. Yeah, it's showing, right. showing mercy, speaking up against injustice in their context. So, right. And it's the relationship between fruit and root as well. Of course, yeah. both of them come into the equation, but you've got yeah. to get the order right. Because if we really right. believe what Scripture says about loving one's neighbor, about helping the downtrodden, the outcast, the, the widow, yeah. uh, all of these types of groups in society, that type of a love only comes as a result of, and a fruit of the gospel. We've got to get that right because Here. only filled with the love of Christ can we even do that well. And so it it absolutely produces that kind of a, a ranking, a priority, an order, and a logic to those things. And then, of course, the mission is to bring more people into vital union with Christ so that the world can be filled with that kind of fruit, which brings yeah. us back to where we began the conversation. You mentioned that as you and Glenn wrote this book, you wanted mission to flow out of the heart of God. And I think so much we need to return to the thinking of missions in this way, because I, I see it in my own tendency in our work for ABWE, as I see our content team put things together when there's a project, when there's a need to be communicated, is we immediately start by talking about the need that exists, the human Forever. need in the world. And we forget to start with the glory of God, the Forever. honor that God is seeking in the world. So talk to us just for a moment about how the glory of God ties into mission. And for a lot of us, this will be review, but that's okay. Mm. Take us to school because I believe that the reason that we tie ourselves in knots on things like, well, is it proclamation or is it movements or is it mercy ministry or some combination of all three is because we haven't put the glory of God first. Mm. And when we get that at the center, everything else falls into place. Yeah. I think there's, there's two sides to this, uh, to the to the glory coin and i think we're really familiar with one side which is as the one living god our god is worthy of the worship of every tribe tongue people every human being who's ever lived he is worthy of that his his worship being given to idols should should frustrate us there should mm, be a, a holy be discontent that that's the way it is in the world. The four billion-ish people involved in, we're just talking about Islam and Buddhism, Hinduism and animistic religion. I think the, uh, and, and so that's really important. I think folks are fair, at least if they've been around mission for a little while or around John Piper at all, are familiar with, with that part. I think the other side of um, of glory is to ask, what is God's glory and how does he talk about himself being glorified? Um, is he like Allah waiting for humanity simply to big him up, to deposit glory into his glory bank? Or instead, is he actually pouring out his glory? Mm. His glory is shining out. And so to actually to glorify God, is to be a part of helping that shine out as clearly as possible, as far as possible. And so it's less of a what's coming back to God. Believe it or not, this is because God talks about it this way, less of what's coming back to God and how much more can flow out of God. So, for instance, John 12, Jesus says, now is the time for the Son of Man to be glorified. So now's the moment. Okay, well, Jesus, what do you mean? And he spends the he spends the, that passage talking about a seed falling into the ground and dying. So what's it mean for the Son of Man to be glorified? It means I'm going to the cross. Mm. If you want to see my glory, if you want to see the clearest, most radiant display of what I'm really like, look to the cross. And so... Yes, God deserves all the worship. His, if, if he were collecting glory in a glory bank, it should be perfectly full, you know, from every human. But he's, 
not actually really doing that. He's, he's seeing how much more of himself can he share with the world? How much more brightly can the radiance of his glory, Christ, mm. be made known in the world? So I think these are both true. And I think they complement each other. And I think that second bit is what we sometimes miss because sometimes we're so committed to what I'm going to win glory for God. Right. (laughs) Instead of saying, God is already shining out. He's already shining out. His glory is already shining forth in the cross. And I want to see, I want to see that shine further. I want to see more, more people come to see the glory of God shining out. So, and The difference that makes, particularly for a missionary, if you think you're the one responsible for getting glory for God and no one's believed in the first however many years you've been there, oh man, I can't imagine, I can't imagine Mm -hmm. the weight you're going to carry if you think you're the one responsible for the glory of God in the Middle East. To the missionary, to the pastor who's feeling that for his flock to the mother praying for her small children and for their salvation. Yeah, you're not the decisive factor, Justin. I think what you just shared for those last few minutes, that alone is worth the price of admission for this show. In fact, leave it a positive rating right now because I don't think that we can emphasize that enough. Look at Isaiah chapter one. I I hate your, your feasts, your offerings, all these things you're doing for me. I want you to do what's right and what's just and, and, and come and let us reason together. And though your sins are scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Or look at Psalm chapter 50. I don't need you. God says, in effect to us, I don't need your sacrifices. I'm not hungry. If I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you all the cattle on a thousand hills are mine. The the right sacrifices are thanksgiving. Why? Because his glory is already there. Yeah, God does not need us like the God of Islam seems to need people to bow the knee in order to to be enough. God is already infinitely overflowingly enough. And when he calls us to glorify him, he's inviting us to bathe in his radiance. He's not inviting us to add to him. And so often whether we're in missions or any other kind of ministry, we think we're adding to God. We think God needs us to do this. I'm guilty of this in my own life. And yet he doesn't need us. And the invitation to be about his mission, to bring him glory is ultimately an invitation to enjoy him more. I I think that that man, if, if that's in this book, then go ahead and pick up the book for that reason alone. There's so much good stuff there. Justin, how can people get a copy of the book and how can they hear more from you and from union? Yeah, thanks for that. You can go to unionpublishing.org and find out uh, how to get a copy of the book. It is designed for small group use. And so maybe this is a way if you're you're trying to help your church understand God's heart for the nations, help them understand why as a church you are supporting works around the world. Uh, maybe this is a, a resource for your church. Yeah, I'd, I'd love uh, to connect with uh, with folks on on Twitter or Facebook. I'm the Justin Shell on Twitter, and to know more about Union, you can go to theolo.gy. Is the the weird little URL we have? So theology with a dot before the G. So theolo.gy. You know, I was on your website this morning and I was thinking that is a neat little URL. So theolo.g and on Twitter at the Justin Shell, that's S-C-H-E-L-L, Justin, U.S. Director of Union and also the co-author of Come and See, A History and a Theology of Mission, along with our friend Glenn Scrivener, who's been on the show before. Justin, thank you for joining us. And for all of you listening or watching, thank you for being a part of this show. The Missions Podcast is a ministry of ABWE. To get more content, go to missionspodcast.com to learn more about ABWE. Go to abwe.org. We value your positive ratings and reviews that helps get the content in front of others who can be blessed by it. And we value your support. If you believe in the mission of the show, you can go to missionspodcast.com slash support. Thank you to all who've given. It lets us get this content out even further. And until next week, as you think and as you go, thank you for watching and listening. We'll see you then.